aspire to become like Mary uh, in terms of uh, piety, in terms of uh, the lifestyle and, and purity. Then we visit Urfa where Abraham lived and he got married to uh, uh, Sarah uh, in Haran, uh, this little town Haran, about 15, 10, 15 miles north of Syria border. <coughs> Uh, again, it's one thing to visit that place, and it's another thing to eat uh, as uh, 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 Dr. Uh, talked about uh, late, uh, earlier. It's another thing to uh, share the food with a family who aspire to become like Abraham uh, in terms of generosity, in terms of uh, hosting people, uh, people in their homes. In the city of Urfa, for a very long time, they did not have uh, the hotel industry. It is a site on the pilgrimage route from uh, Istanbul or other parts of Anatolia and the Balkans uh, to the Mecca and Medina. So they had many, many pilgrims, thousands of pilgrims every year uh, around the time of the pilgrimage, Muslim pilgrimage. And because of, the, uh, uh, because of Abraham's heritage or tradition of uh, hospitality, uh, this town didn't have many hotels. People raced uh, to host people in their homes. And there are reports that some people, some family members would, be, would actually cry and they didn't get a chance to host somebody in their homes. And they would send their children to actually invite uh, the pilgrims to come and stay with them. So it is a, a different thing to, to visit the site and then meet with people who maintain the tradition, maintain the heritage of Abraham. Uh, for Rumi's tomb, uh, which is in Kondia, uh, it's one thing to visit uh, Rumi, then it's another thing to visit a school there. And these are all parts of the trips that we organize. Uh, it's another thing to visit a school that I meet with the children who paint pictures of Rumi and uh, write his uh, words, uh, verses uh, in uh, nice uh, scripture, uh, calligraphy. Uh, so it, uh, this human dimension uh, really is the one that the participants in the trips cherish most. And many of them said that it was really a, a transforming experience for them. So I, I hope that uh, you will get a chance to participate in one of those trips uh, through our local uh, representatives here. Uh, you might be curious, uh, the Turkish American community in uh, Kansas or Missouri, for that matter, is not really that big. Uh, even in Houston, where I live, uh, it's size about 10,000 people, uh, which is not much by, by any standards. Uh, the Vietnamese community is about 100, 150,000, the Pakistani community is 100,000. But we have a very uh, nice big uh, cultural center, uh, three story, 35,000 square feet, and uh, many activities that involve the Turkish American community. Uh, and they are, uh, I would say, maybe half of them are active in uh, interfaith and intercultural dialogue. So you might be curious as to why, what makes uh, the Turkish Americans, especially the new generation, uh, why do they value interfaith dialogue so much? To understand that, we need to go back to Turkey and look at Turkey in the uh, 90s, early 90s. Uh, Turks are not uh, alien to interfaith dialogue and uh, living in a diverse community. You see some uh, pictures framed. Uh, photocopies of some documents uh, by the walls, maybe you get a chance after the dinner. Those are documents dating from the Ottoman Empire time. Uh, Ottoman Empire uh, ruled what is now Turkey and the Balkans and North Africa and Middle East for about 500 years. Uh, the ruling uh, group were essentially ethnic Turks, but the, the empire had uh, only 10% Turkish population. The 90% were of other ethnicities. So they, they were very uh, used to living in a diverse uh, society. So these uh, edicts or verdicts by the sultans demonstrate uh, the administration's uh, open and uh, welcoming attitude toward religious uh, minorities, uh, which actually may be majority in some areas. So Turks are not alien to the idea of interfaith dialogue and living together in peace, but uh, something happened uh, around the time of the First World War. Uh, parts of Turkey were uh, occupied by uh, Greeks, by British, by French, by Italian, by Russians, uh, in collaboration with the Armenians in the north, northeast part, uh, and the French in the southeast part. And uh, some of the local minorities, not all of them, some of the local minorities collaborated with the invading forces. So when the Turks uh, fought their independence war in 1919 uh, and 20 and 21st, uh, they were suspicious, they became suspicious of the uh, religious minorities. Is your loyalty uh, to the country or is it your loyalty to another big power or your religion uh, besides uh, the country, against the country? So this suspicion and the cold kind of attitude continued uh, 
even into the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, in uh, 1994, an uh, organization was established by the name of the Foundation for Journalists and uh, Writers. And the honorary chairman of this foundation is a, a Turkish Muslim scholar by the name of Fethullah Gülen. Uh, he is, uh, by many accounts, the most respected and authoritative uh, religious figure uh, in Turkey, uh, even exceeding in terms of influence the director of religious affairs, uh, who is a government officer in Turkey, which is a secular country, by the way. Uh, but he was a very authoritative figure, also a thinker, uh, a poet, uh, an educational activist. So he said, uh, now people are talking about, some intellectuals are talking about clash of civilizations. And they think that uh, the religious differences will play a big role there. As representatives and leaders of faith communities, we should, so, we should show a common stance, solidarity, that religion is not and will not be the primary cause or the root of conflicts. It can become uh, a means to resolve and prevent those conflicts. For this, as the representatives of religious communities, we should show solidarity. So he went ahead and met uh, with the uh, religious leaders of Turkey and the religious minorities. Uh, Turkey is about 90, 99%, 99.5% Muslim. But there is a small uh, Greek Orthodox community, a small Armenian Orthodox community, about 60,000. Uh, a small Jewish community, about 20,000. Uh, a small Assyrian community. So he met uh, with all of these leaders in person and they organized events together. You know, just handshaking and uh, being together in an event uh, with such a leader may not sound like a big thing uh, looking at, at it from uh, the United States point of view, but it was a big thing in Turkey because of the history that I just shared with you. So it started uh, uh, with some suspicion in the larger community, but then the community embraced it. They said, yes, this is actually our tradition. Yes, we did have difficulties, but let's open a new page. We have already tried fighting and killing. Let's try something else. So the community in general embraced it, the government embraced it, and the government for the first time instituted an office for interfaith dialogue under the Director of Religious Affairs. Many universities with the uh, local city governments, they organized interfaith conferences. So it uh, caught uh, attention and momentum, and it is continuing today. There is a lot of work to be done. Uh, so the youth, uh, the college students, or, or adults uh, who witnessed this uh, process in Turkey uh, become inspired by this momentum. And wherever Turkish Americans of uh, uh, this generation are around the world, you will see that uh, their cultural centers, their uh, dialogue centers, they will be active in interfaith inter 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 dialogue. 